Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone out there in Facebook land. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Lewis Reyes, and I am your exchange's senior enlisted advisor. I am super pumped today because I believe we have a guest from a probably our first professional organization. Is that correct, Julie? I think this you is our got first it. professional yep. organization. You're right? always but, right, but you're definitely no. right about that. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get to our guest, though, let me introduce everyone out there to my co-host today, Julie Mitchell. Julie, how are you doing? Hey, it's so good to see you this week, Chief. Doing great. Hope you are, too. Uh, I'm doing outstanding. Let's get this going. Julie, you mind introducing our guest? I'm thrilled to introduce today's guest. It is, we're so honored to have him with us. He served our nation as a soldier for more than 30 years, achieving the rank of 15th Sergeant Major of the Army. And since his retirement from the Army, he has been working with the Association of the United States Army as Vice President of NCO and Soldier Programs. Please help us welcome Sergeant Major of the Army retired, Dan Daly. Hey! Yay, SMA, SMA, SMA. SMA. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you very very much. We're so, so glad to have you here with us. And for all those watching, drop us a note in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. Share some love with Sergeant Major Daly and you can leave questions for him too. And we will try to get to them live. It's also a really good time to start your watch party and enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not already following our page, you should be because Chief Chats are every Tuesday and Thursday, and if you follow us, you will stay in the know on who's coming up next, and we always have big names coming up, so you'll want to stay stay linked in with us. <laughs> well, let's, hey, let's get this going. SMA Daily, thank you for taking uh, some time to hang out with the Exchange family. We truly appreciate it. So let us know, where are you coming to us from today, and how have you been? Well, Chief, first, uh, I'll tell you, thank you for the opportunity, both you and Julie hosting me today on, on the show, and uh, I'm a big fan of uh, APHIS and the exchange. And matter of fact, I just shopped there yesterday and I can publicly advocate now because uh, I'm no longer the SMA for shop at your exchange. It's a great value. <laughs> it's a great place. And most of all, the money goes back to our soldiers and airmen. Um, and I'll tell you, being part of that organization, being part of the board for years, it's all for good purpose. So, but I am live from just outside our nation's capital here in Arlington, Virginia at the Association of United States, uh, Army headquarters nestled uh, just right behind Fort Myer. If people are familiar with the Arlington National Cemetery and the small Fort Myer. We're just right behind there, just a few blocks in a beautiful part of Arlington. And, uh, and luckily the storm has passed us uh, all as well here. Um, uh, the rain subsided and we have a sunny, clear day. Hmm. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm glad that the storm didn't get you and y'all are, are safe from that. So earlier this year, you assumed the role of vice president of NCO and soldier programs for AUSA. So can you tell us first a little bit about what AUSA is and then about your role in the organization? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you know, I feel like the luckiest boy in the world. I, you know, I got to be the 15th Sergeant of the Army. And then after that, um, I got great advice from a senior general officer who I trusted, General David Perkins. And he said, uh, you know, you can find a job but the great job will find you. And that's exactly what happened. I got a call from our president and CEO, uh, General Retired Carter Ham, and he asked me over for dinner and said, hey, we'd like you to come work for the organization. At the time, the 13th SMA, Ken Preston, was working in this newly created position for NCO and Soldier Programs, a fine gentleman. And I said, sir, I have to respectfully decline because that's Ken Preston's and I have the honor. He was my mentor, one of my people that brought me up in the army. And he said, well, no, he's ready to retire and he'd like you to replace him. I said instantaneously, yes, Um, (laughs) an opportunity uh, to continue to give back to our soldiers. And that's what it's all about. And, you know, I know we're going to talk more about what we do here at the Association of the United States Army today, um, but it was an absolute opportunity to let you in on a little funny secret. I came back from that dinner engagement. My wife said, did, how'd it go? I said, well, I took the job. She goes, well, what are you going to make? I said, I have no idea. I just took the job. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that's faith right there. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, because it's an honor and privilege to work for um, our first professional military association, the Association of the United States Army, which, by the way, a little history fact, was started by the Army and run by active duty officers in its first beginnings. At the time, the vice chief staff of the Army was the first president. 
and the president of the United States was the first honorary president of AUSA 70 years ago this year, July 5th. Wow. Congratulations. Happy birthday. Happy yeah. birthday. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you 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 kind of hint you hinted at uh, what AUSA is about, but and what about your role? You've been there a few months. Yeah. What do you hope to accomplish at AUSA? Well, first and foremost, I'm the as you, as Julie as you've uh, said, I'm the vice president of NCO and Soldier Programs, and we've got uh, a few divisions here. But um, I'm the lucky one to run the one that's uh, what I think is our most important mission: taking care of our soldiers and their families. Um, in our job at AUSA, since its birth 70 years ago, has been to educate, inform, and connect. And we do that by connecting um, soldiers and its leaders, the United States Army, um, to the American public, to um, our elected leaders. And we represent them throughout the halls of Congress, um, all throughout the United States, through the extension of um, our 122 chapters in six regions. And we go beyond the borders of the United States. We also have chapters in, across in Europe and places like Dubai. Um, so really, globally, we represent our nation's uh, soldiers through our extension of our 122 chapters and our six regions. For me personally, at a, uh, NCO and Soldier Programs, I have the job of taking care of our soldiers um, and supporting the Sergeant of the Army and supporting our chapters in that role. And to give you an example, um, one of the things we did today is Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant SMA Grinston has a new initiative called This Is My Squad and to help promote his new initiative. Um, we have a couple of things that we're supporting him with, but one of them today was to say thank you to the old guard soldiers who are stationed here in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, who during this crisis are continuing the mission. They do everything from our nation's most precious ceremonies to burying uh, our dead in our international cemetery and honoring their service. And they haven't missed a beat. And they're out there every single day. So each week in the month of August for both AUSA's 70th birthday and support the Sergeant Major of the Army's This Is My Squad initiative, we're recognizing a squad every week. And we've taken some lunch, a couple of goodies and things that we put to give them a free membership to the association. And we just sit down with them and talk to them about life, leadership, and thank them for their service. You kind of hinted at my next question, right? So mm -hmm. I'm a member of the Air Force Sergeant Association. I'm a lifetime member. How do soldiers get involved with AUSA? Is it, you know, do you, do you buy yearly memberships, lifetime membership? Where do they go to to find out about AUSA and, and to sign up? How do you do that? Yeah, that's a great question. And one of my jobs is to educate our service about our association. They're a professional association. Um, of course, I want every soldier to be a member. But what, what my job is also do is to demonstrate the value proposition of being a member of AUSA. And really by showing them through word and deed that um, we're here to support them and take care of their needs and support the leadership of the Army. They can go to AUSA.org um, and they can look across our webpage. It's easy to find the link inside of our webpage to become a member, um, or they could reach out to one of the local chapters in each one of our major installations, Army installations across the United States and outside for both our Guard and Reserve have uh, 122 chapters in six regions. Um, but the easiest way is to go to our website, AUSA.org, and they can find out how to be a member and all the value and benefits of being a member of AUSA. Uh, you know, that's that great information. Um, so for a lot of people out there, you know, there's this um, there's this thing right from the joint, the military coalition, which is 31, 31 of, or 32 of these organizations, right? AFSA, Air Force Army Association, Chief Petty Officer Association. And we all team up, right? When there's something to fight for the military, Oh, yeah. We, all, we start lobbying. We team up. Well, you know, me being a member, but they team up. They have lobbyists and, you know, they fight for our rights. And that, I think that's what you're doing right now. Right. Making sure soldiers are entitled to what they deserve. Should something come up where, you know, they're, they're, uh, a benefit is being taken away. Absolutely. And it's one of the reasons why AUSA was created from the very beginning to represent the Army. Um, as you said, we work very closely with the other associations and we're not in competition with any of them. Matter of fact, the Navy League's building is right across the street. Good friend of mine, who was the previous Mick Pond, is their president. Um, and we stay in close coordination. And when there's an issue across all services, Department of Defense, we bind together to represent all the services on Capitol Hill to say, hey, this is what we need for our service members. These are the benefits they need for their families. Um, and we're always in uh, close coordination with the leadership of the Army and Department of Defense when we help make those decisions and we help advocate on their behalf. Excellent. So it's kind of been a crazy year. Uh, 2020 has been a year like no other. So 
what are AUSA's strategic objectives during this time? And then how do your goals help those who are serving today? Absolutely. So our objectives are the same. I mean, uh, we have been hit very hard. There isn't a single person in America that hasn't been affected by the current crisis of COVID-19 and lots of other things going on across our country right now. But our job is to remain steady in the saddle, support the Army. Um, the Army has to maintain readiness regardless of what's going on. Um, even during this current crisis, our soldiers are out there training. They're deployed across the, uh, the globe. And it's our job of the association, their professional association, to maintain that steady support as we've done. And we're doing that by educating, connecting, informing, and supporting in every way we can. I could give you countless examples of how the 122 chapters around the globe have reached out to do all kinds of things of helping soldiers while they're in quarantine or pre-deployment exercises or helping sponsor community events around um, our service members in the communities they live in. Um, so each and every day, I'm proud of what uh, our association does and all the volunteers that uh, volunteer countless hours of, of work just, just to support our soldiers. And Chief, you mentioned before, you know, we even have Air Force members of the Association of the United States Army. And, uh, you know, uh, if you want to be a member of AUSA, uh, you can just go to AUSA.org and you can sign up because, you know what, if a service member's in need, um, we don't care what uniform. Our, our chapters and our association will do what we can to help take care of our service members. Our primary focus is obviously the Army. We're very proud of that. We are the biggest. And of course, this might be a little slighted, but we, you know, I believe we're the best, but they're all very good. And all the associations do a wonderful job of representing their services. Uh, wholeheartedly agree, wholeheartedly agree, sir. Um, so AUSA usually has a big conference that the exchange does attend. Uh, we know it's slated for October, but I think with all that's going on during the pandemic, what's the plan for that conference right now? Yeah, um, and unfortunately, we, they, our president had to make this announcement just two short weeks ago, is that uh, we're going to have to shift. So there's still a conference. That's good news. Still same time frame in October, second week. And, um, but it's not going to be in person. Because of the restrictions uh, currently here in the Washington, D.C. area, we normally hold our annual conference in the D.C. Convention Center. It's one of the largest conferences um, there is. And unfortunately, um, we're not going to have the ability to reunite the Army like we really do each year. Um, but we're going to put on a world-class virtual event. And we're working through that process now, working with uh, some vendors to help us deliver that capability. Um, we're still going to bring in the, the senior leaders of the Army to talk about the most current relevant topics. And I'll be hosting the Sergeant of the Army for his big initiatives release for the, for the year virtually. Um, we're, we're still going to announce the best NCO and soldier of the year for the United States Army. So all those things are still done. And we're going to connect to all of our members and soldiers and and business partners and community and elected leaders through digital means this year. We're even gonna have a, a virtual display for, because normally in the convention center, we have all those big displays set up yeah. and, and we're gonna have a virtual display for, so you can go through and you can virtually walk through and see the, the different vendors and people that support um, the association. Oh, that's terrific. I'm glad you guys have a have a plan. We I was part of the APHIS team that was out there last year and it was so great. And I'm I hate that y'all can't reunite this year, but it sounds like you guys have some good plans in place and we're look we'll look forward to that and we'll stay tuned to your website, I guess, for for more information on that. Absolutely. We'll have uh, details coming very shortly on the website and also uh, registration for those events. Um and uh just as a little reminder, a little footnote too, and um, AUSA is always doing events. So we have a noon report, which I commonly host, people like the Sergeant of the Army and senior leaders. And coming up in the very near future, I'm gonna be hosting the Sergeant of the Army and squad leaders across the Army to talk about the tough subject of race and diversity. And that is on 31 August at noon, okay. Eastern Standard Time. And I'm gonna host the SEAC, the Senior List Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff on 14 ah. September to talk about everything the SEAC wants to talk about and some of his initiatives on the Noon Report as well. So that's live, broadcast live via the web. And it's called the Noon Report at noon, Eastern Standard Time. Um, and we do those quite frequently and have some great speakers out there. So um, I'd invite uh, Tom Scholl or the next Chief, chief um, to come do one of our podcast series or do one of our noon reports, you're always welcome here. Um, we're big fans of the exchange here at the association. Love that, that's great. I'm sure when Mr. Shull hears this, he will, uh, he'll, <laughs> he'll be right, he'll, he'll be there. So that, no, that's great. Thank you for that invitation and, and that opportunity. And hey, you're gonna have fun with the SEAC. He is 
awesome. He was our guest oh, yeah. a few weeks ago and phenomenal guest. So I, I'm eager to hear your interview with him. Just yeah, he's a great, that he's September, a great man. So. I know him, um, chief personally, and he is, uh, he's a great man. He's the right person to be our CEO. Agree. Excellent. So you touched, you did touch on this a little bit, um, but everybody, including the army, we're all dealing with COVID, but we all have to find a way to go on. Our, our mission must continue. So what about, you know, you and in, in your job being so new to it, how, how have you been affected by that these last few months? Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, we've all been affected and we, we're not immune to that. Um, when I first hit the ground running in this job shortly after I retired, uh, yeah, I jumped on and I started doing um, in-person events um, with all of our chapters out there supporting our soldiers. And immediately we had to put on the brakes and our president sat all the vice presidents down and said, we have to do something to make sure that we maintain our support, the level of support that our, our members and our soldiers expect from our association. So it all started on 3 April for me. And what happened was a, one of our chapters said, SMA, we have a bunch of soldiers that are being quarantined as a result of redeployment from, a, from an operation um, because of COVID-19. They weren't sick, but just taking precautions. And, you know, they, they, they sit around the barracks and they, they, they get a little bored sometimes. And can you reach out and just talk to them and give them some leadership and mentorship? And it was a phenomenal event that the soldiers really enjoyed. Just got on with the Zoom. Hey, ask me anything. Talk about any subject you want to talk. No agenda whatsoever. And the soldiers had a great time. And we spent the last three months doing that all across the Army, um, especially with our Guard and Reserve soldiers, who, unfortunately, many of them um, lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19. They were laid off, and they relied heavily on their drills, and now they couldn't come together and do these drills. But the, the Chief of the Army Reserve and the Army Guard allowed them to do digital drills. So we've been filling in as leader development sessions for digital drills. I just did one last weekend with uh, Las Vegas, and uh, all the soldiers are at home but they're getting um, leadership training and they're doing a lot of great valuable training online. And part of that is the ability for us to log in and do a two hour leadership session, question and answers, and talk about the challenges of leadership and how to deal with them and how to deal with them at each level of the career. And, and I, what I found is uh, uh, now I'm personally mentoring a bunch of those individuals <laughs> and, uh, and it's been a wonderful time. And uh, we do it 24 hours a day around the globe. It doesn't matter. And what I found is that, you know, you, you can't let COVID beat you. We're all in this together. we got to find ways to continue the mission. And what I've really found is where I used to fly and travel and see 100 soldiers or 100 of our chapter members, now I can reach 5,000 like we did on a, li a Facebook Live event with Hawaii. 5,000 views. So there's ways to really get your word out and communicate at a greater scale with some of this technology. And if you don't know how to use it, those young soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marine, they'll teach you pretty quick. And uh, there isn't a single platform that I haven't not been on, I think. Now, I've been, I've been on them all. So, so yeah, we've kind of shifted our mission a little bit, but we're continuing to provide that support. And our chapters, uh, as I, I can't talk about them enough, they found uh, similar ways to do that. And today, we did an in-person event, but we maintained mm -hmm. discipline with uh, keeping separation. We kept our masks on, making sure we're sanitized. And we had a great event with uh, soldiers and recognizing today and supporting the SMAs. This is my squad initiative. So there's ways to do this. I think that uh, leaders and it's our responsibility to find ways to continue the mission. So as you know, right now we have soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines, Coasties, military families. They're watching from all over the world. That's the beauty of Facebook, right? Get connect with anyone anywhere so what do you have words of encouragement for anyone watching today who who might need to hear a, a hang in there um what kind of words of hope can you offer yeah you know i'm a i'm a i'm a, a glass half full kind of guy um I, there is opportunity and positivity in every situation there's some bad times um but our service members know that this isn't the worst times and we're going to get through this i'm going to do it together um, what I would say is, and listen to your leaders, um, not everybody's affected the same by COVID, but everybody can infect somebody. Um, and it's everybody's responsibility to take on this mission that affects us all. And everybody does have a part in this fight against COVID-19. Now, my level of confidence from our professional uh, medical people here in the United States and our military who are all working together with the government agencies, my level of confidence to find a cure for this is 100%. But it's going to take time. And until then, we can save lives by everybody doing something in their part of COVID-19. 
And that is, you know, wearing a mask and decontaminating and making sure you limit your exposure to the people that you don't need to and finding creative ways to get the mission done while maintaining safety. SMA Daddy, thank you for those words of inspiration. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through these comments really quick. A lot of people saying hello from uh, Fort Worth PX right now. Uh, Ryan Smith says, I saw SMA Daily at the Armed Forces Bowl last year. Hello from Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, Spangalum, Germany. A lot, of, a lot of people from Germany watching. Soldier for Life. Lourdes says Soldier for Life. Uh, um, we, we do have a question here from Selena Lewis. She would like to ask, can you speak on what AUSA is doing to help prevent soldier and veteran suicide? Yeah, absolutely. And this is a tough, challenging uh, task. And, you know, as a senior leader in the Army, this is something we worked endlessly on. And it's something that's never going to end. You have to continue to fight this fight to identify, first, first and foremost, identify the symptoms um, and intervene. And that's the, all the experts will tell you, that's the number one thing you have to do is identify the problem and intervene. And intervention prevents suicide. It does. It's proven. And uh, everything the Army does, we support. Every single thing. And just like the other day, I talked about mentorship and reaching out to these soldiers. And when soldiers are alone and um, when they're, they're cooped up because of they're being quarantined or something like that, it's important for leaders to continue to reach out, even more so when, that, when we are in person. Contact needs to increase to make sure we prevent these things. And we're doing that right now by reaching out and helping our Army leaders be an extension of their ability to reach out and talk to our soldiers. Um, to give an example, and I won't use names, but I was talking about how I was doing a leader development session with the Las Vegas National Guard troops the other day, the chemical brigade out there, and a shout out to them out there. Um, wonderful time I had. You know, one of them reached out and said, hey, I'm having a little challenges with uh, redeployment. I just came back. You know, can we reach out? So this week I'm reaching out and just talking to them and, to, and help them work through the challenges of a guy that's been through five deployments of being separated from your family and, and you know, how, how the challenges of integration and how to deal with them, you know. Um, so I think that's how we support our, our army. Um, we, we make sure that we're supporting their day-to-day -day operations and educating and, and informing and connecting the American public, but staying in tune and helping them also uh, reach out and touch uh, our soldiers and make sure that we're talking to them and tell them, hey, this is going to be okay. We're going to get through this and we're going to do it together. Outstanding. Uh, Selena also says a soldier in Alaska might need some motivating words due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So. If you have a chance, maybe you could reach out to someone in Alaska to talk to the. I'd love to, and we will. We will. We, have, we, we know some great people out there in Alaska, and uh, I'll tell you, I wish I could go to Alaska right now and go visit. <laughs> uh, this is the good time of year. Uh, yeah. When I was a sergeant major of the army, I always visit Alaska in the summer. The soldiers would ask me, "Why do you only come up here in the summer? Because it's cold up here in the winter." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So Sergeant Major, you've served in so many leadership positions. What is your own personal approach to leadership? And then what advice do you have for younger service members who are kind of trying to find their own style? Absolutely. Like, like everyone, Julie, my leadership um, changed and adapted throughout the years from, from lessons I learned from great leaders that I wanted to emulate, right? And from experiences and from making mistakes and, and living through challenges and tribulations and going to war and, uh, and dealing with the diverse population of young men and women who come to our army from all around the world. And so I had no one defined leadership style or trait. I think I, um, I did my best to adapt it to the changing times and needs of uh, the current situation. But one thing I, I, I will take personal pride on is the fact that I would listen to our soldiers, um, very much so. And what I learned and what I had to humble myself and continue to remind myself as a very senior leader is you can learn something from even the brand new private in the United States Army, the Air Force, Marine Corps, or Coast Guard. And there's something to be learned from everybody and everybody should be heard. Um, now, does that mean you have to do everything that your soldiers want? No, we wouldn't be in a good place if we did everything they want, <laughs> but it is our job to do everything they need. And if you want to find out the needs of your service members, just go down there and talk to them and listen to them. And they got some really good ideas and they got some really good thoughts. And, and if you, as a, in positions like being the Sergeant Major of the Army, you, you have to reconnect with them on a regular basis because the Army is a big institution and all the services are. 
and it's different based upon the organization that's here or geographic location they're stationed or the theater of operation that they're in and, or the leadership inside the organization. And to find out what's truly going on is when you grab an MRE, sit in the back of a Bradley fighting vehicle or a tank and, and you talk to the soldiers, they'll tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help them God. <laughs> <laughs> So I think leaders, um, and there's a lot of great leaders out there doing a lot of great things. One is stay physically fit. Keep your soldiers. It's a, if there's one thing you can do for your, your service members is keep them fit. That keeps them mentally and physically and emotionally stable and healthy. And, um, and talk to them every day. And in times like now, talk to even more often. And re reaffirm and encourage them that everything's going to be okay. And we're going to get through this together. So you brought up physical fitness and, you know, right now it's hard. Some, some of the gyms are closed, you know, group fitness classes aren't meeting things that people used to yeah. do to, for recreation, you just can't do anymore, but you just mentioned it is so important to still stay fit to fight. How, Absolutely. how have you, how have you been staying active? Do you have any, do you have any tips for staying active and fit during this pandemic? Absolutely. Julia, and, and I hate to do this to you, but no excuse. There's no excuse for fitness, right? So it's not hard. And, and why do I say that? Because um, this, is, this is where time, where leaders shine. Get creative. Think about ways to keep your soldiers actively involved in their lives, right? Just because you can't come together to do PT every day is not an excuse not to do PT. Um, for me personally, um, I can't live without it. I mean, uh, I got mad when it was a thunder lightning storm because I couldn't go out and run at 630. Now, I, I still owe myself PT today, and it's going to happen. But yesterday, six miles. Saturday, I went 40-mile bike ride. And I know the bikers are out there saying, oh, 40 miles ain't much. Well, it is in the mountains of Pennsylvania. That's different than flats, right? So um, <laughs> I try to stay shape because it's, it, it, it's, it's, your, it's your body. And it responds to how you take care of it and what you put inside of it. And, but if there's one thing that you can do for yourself um, is get active and stay active and stay fit. It, it, it's just so good for you. And, and that's why we want our soldiers to maintain healthy. And, and things like COVID-19, you keep your immune system healthy. It's the best thing you can do to protect yourself. Absolute best thing you do to get breakfast. And not only that, it makes you feel good. And I always wanted my soldiers to feel good, look good, hold their head high, and the American people to say, I'm proud that that individual is defending our nation. Oh, great advice, I SMA Daily. That. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. And just as important as, as physical fitness, right, is the mental fitness and the resiliency piece. Do you have any advice for our troops and military community on how to cultivate a resilient mindset? Absolutely. I'll tell you, we were, I was real big on, we created a thing in the United States Army called uh, MRT, Master Resilience Training. Um, where we, just like our master fitness trainers down at every company level, we sent our young non-commissioned officers at the staff sergeant level to go get master resilience training. And this stuff works. And it's about communication and understanding um, the things that, that bring stress upon your life. Now, service members are exposed to things that, that are going to continue to bring stress upon you. I mean, tell me something that's not stressful about being in service. Um, but there's a way to become resilient, just like you train for any one of the services, physical fitness exams, there is science proven that you can train to be resilient to stress and stressful environments. Mm -hmm. And first identifying them, um, talking about them and coping with them. You know, I'm a big fan of SMA Grinston and this is my squad because this all gets into the core essence of what he's talking about, right? That squad leader should know everything about that soldier and in the Air Force, the Marine Corps, and, you know, the word squad is kind of universal. It's our team. And at every echelon, there's a squad. That's not just for junior soldiers, right? So that's, SMA will tell you his squad is the team in his office. And it's about talking to them and communicating and finding out. You know, we talked about the tough subject earlier, suicide and intervention. And in order to intervene, you got to know what's going on with that soldier or service member. And the way you do that is to communicate with them regularly. And when you do that, you know when there's a change. You can tell. You, you can see the, the thoughts and the feelings and the way they're communicating or how they're, they remove themselves from the organization. And you can identify those. And it just builds a healthy, strong community. And, and when, if you build an organization that it constantly communicates with the other and it shares, it shares their feelings and thoughts with each other, um, every one of those people inside that squad becomes a censor. And when something goes wrong with one part of that element, 
every person in that squad knows because they're so used to knowing how what right looks like in private daily um, or you know another member of the squad. So I think the most important thing is um, you got to promote that. And the SMA is a whole lot better than I am talking about it um, when we talk about the tough subject of race and diversity, right? Mm -hmm. You, you got to talk about this. You got to have open conversations. We're all from different walks of life. We all come from different geographic locations. We all have different experiences of how we are raised and communicating to each other about it is how we're going to get through this. It's how we're going to understand um, the way you feel and I feel about certain things. And it's worked. And the military has demonstrated success in adapting things that, that were not you know, popular in the US. I mean, we did with don't ask, don't tell, when we integrated that in the military, we did a phenomenal job. I'm so proud of what the military did to integrate that. Transgender, we did such a phenomenal job and we could do the same thing with race and inclusion. If we just have great conversations about it, we keep it on the radar and keep focused on it and keep pushing on. I think that, do uh, you see that question, Julie, right there at the end by Byron Lewis? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that um, we kind of just touched on it, but Byron is watching and he's asking with COVID-19 and the things with race happening in our country, how do you motivate leaders to look past their bias and lead? Leaders are younger and they're about as old as those they lead. And it's hard not to start to relate or not want to talk about the hard topics such as race. So I think he's asking, how do you get past bias, your, your yeah, own I bias and, and learn to lead? And I'm proud of the leadership of our Army right now, from the chief of staff and the vice to the secretary and the sergeant of the Army. They're having the conversations and they're the most senior leaders of our Army. And they're saying you can have this conversation. I mean, the sergeant of the Army got on social media and talked about the challenges he personally had with race and inclusion, personally had it. And I think that opens up the door to say, hey, listen, if the most senior leaders of the Army and the military can openly talk about their own personal experiences and how it affects them then it can be done at every echelon. And there should not be a generation gap between this. There should be understanding across all generations of how people feel and how they're affected by it. And having that conversation is the start to getting better at it. I, I truly believe it works. Um, so I'm a big fan of what the Sergeant Major of the Army did. Uh, we did a podcast about it. We just talked about that tough subject and why he decided to speak out about those things. And I think it, it's, it's a great example of leadership of getting up there, having the tough conversation starting that conversation. And now what we got to do as a military is continue it. You know, I am proud though. I'm proud of our military. And one thing I would say, I'm proud of the fact that, uh, you know, our soldiers do a phenomenal job of every, every day of staying politically biased, you know, and that's what they should do, right? They all are entitled to their own opinions. They're all entitled to their own political affiliations. But when they're in that uniform, I'm so proud of our service members because they stand firm and stand proud for what's right. And that's protecting the American people. Absolutely. You're at your spot. You're spot on, sir. And your advice is really in your words. They're really resonating with folks who are watching at home. Um, John says, wisdom, you can't let COVID beat you. And he put that in quotes. That's what you said. Mm -hmm. And, and then mm -hmm. um, Mike Wag says that you're an outstanding role model and inspirational leader. I enjoy hearing his mentorship. Thank you for the impact you've made and are currently accomplishing. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Lewis. Byron Lewis, uh, I think he wants to talk to you in person. SMA. He says he agrees with you. He agrees. I agree with the top leadership, but middle managers are afraid to follow the lead because in the military, we never talk religion, politics, or race. Well, I'll hear, 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 tell them, and, well, and they're listening. He's, he's watching. <laughs> yeah. What I want him to do is I want him to, and we're, we're going to target that. And the Sergeant Major, we're helping the Sergeant Major of the Army do that on 31 August. We're going to bring squad leaders from, from all across the Army, live feed. And the great thing about our noon reports is you can, you can log in and ask questions while the Sergeant Major of the Army, while those squad leaders are on there. And we're going to have that discussion. That's why the Sergeant Major of the Army wants to bring these squad leaders in, because exactly what you're talking about. We got to attack this from all angles, from the very senior leaders of the Army, from the very brand new soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardmen coming in. You know we indoctrinate them into the culture. The culture of our United States military is that we are one. We are inclusive. We are an organization um, that works together. Regardless of who you are, where you're from, or what color you are, or what your race, your, your sexual preference is, or your religious belief, you're here to do a job. And that job is to defend the freedoms of this country. And those freedoms include 
inclusion from all that, being part, be part of this great nation and being represented equally as a American citizen. And this is coming up August 31st. You said, I know that uh, I'll be tuning in. I think a, lo a lot of us who are watching will, will yeah. definitely tune in to hear this. So you served in the army for more than 30 years, uh, retiring earlier this year. You've left a long legacy of, you know, with your service. And when you look back on your time in the army, what stands out the most to you? And what do you carry with you from that time in uniform? Uh, well, I think what stands out the most is, of course, the men and women. Um, there is no better feeling than serving alongside um, the greatest gift the American people can give, and that's the American soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman. It is truly impressive. You know, I talk to uh, a lot of people across the country, and and uh, it is kind of a uh, a tradition here in America to say that well, the next generation is not as good as we were, and that's been going on for gosh, since the start of this country. Well, I'm here to tell you, these, this generation these, of young men and women, the ones we get in the United States military are phenomenal. They're better than we were. They're smarter, wow. they're fit, um, they care. And when, when in a combat situation, they do exactly what they need to do to fight and win. And it is so impressive to see. And um, it is a humbling experience to be part of. So I think uh, what carries away for me is just the opportunity to be a soldier. Um, I was the luckiest boy in the world as I opened with because I got selected to be the Sergeant of the Army. But I would have left the Army had I only served for three years and been very proud of the fact that I was just a soldier. And be able to say that um, is an incredible humbling opportunity. Um, I'm very proud personally of some of the things that uh, I was part of. Um, I never did anything by myself as the SMA. It takes a lot of people to, to demonstrate change across our big military, but professionally, professionalizing our military education system, accrediting um, our SAR Majors Academy, and creating things like uh, the credentialing assistance program for our service members is some of the great things I got to be part of the team to, to help change. And of course, the soldiers will tell you, black socks, headphones, and tattoos were the, the thing that SMA Daily did. The, and I, I enjoyed doing those because they were the right things to do for our soldiers. Um, that's probably what made me popular on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so what were, what were some of the, what was some of the mindset of those changes? Where did that come from? Where did that stem so, from? I think I'm one of those soldiers. I, I was very lucky. I had phenomenal leaders. I was the, the young private that was thrust into an organization, the brand new in the army. I was, I had the best squad leader in the battalion. His name was Staff Sergeant Davis. He was phenomenal. And he taught us from day one. And then, and then I, when I was a young squad leader, I had a phenomenal platoon sergeant, the best. I mean, when I was a first sergeant, my battalion sergeant major was a, he, he won the best ranger battalion. I just fell into all these units that had all these real, I was like this, this, like this middle of the road guy that had, you know, really good leaders carrying him along the whole way and teaching me the right things to do. And I said that when I took the position of the SMA is the reason why I'm standing here um, it's just, I'm just an average kid from Northeastern Pennsylvania is all these great leaders. I fell into this path of these people that said, Hey, here's the right direction to go. Here's the right compass heading. And here's how you do it. I guess it was just my job to listen. Um, and that's, what's great about our army. There's so many people out there. I would tell young soldiers is find that person. They're there. They're somewhere in your unit. You find them and you emulate them and you use every opportunity you can to get as much information out of that individual to say, hey, how did you do this? How did you become successful? How did you become a great leader? And I'll, pro I'll promise you, they'll sit you down and, and they'll share it all with you. And, um, and that mentorship, I think, is something that's key and important. I think that's why um, my, m much of my success, or probably all of it, is attributed to the fact that I had really great leaders. And uh, I, I, I am truly blessed to have had the opportunity to serve alongside them and and then pull me along the way to become the Sergeant of the Army. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm going to switch gears real quick and ask, a, ask another question, right? So you sat on the board of the of directors for AFES. What was that experience like? And, and can you kind of tell the audience what that's like and what kind of decisions had to be made behind the scenes? Because they don't get to see that, right? We get all the phone calls. Yeah. Some people say, AFES yeah. is a mafia. You're on your own. You guys are just a rogue organization. I'm like, no. No, we no. have a board of directors we report to. We're no. not rogue. 
Yeah, that's yeah. Right. The president, Tom Shul will tell you, he very much uh, appreciated uh, my participation on the board. <laughs> you know, um, the senior list advisors from the Air Force and the Army are, are, are rightfully so members of the board of directors. And it has a real board of, with fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the Armed Force Financial Exchange Services is run appropriately and in line with its mission and doing what it's designed to do, provide services to our service members and families stateside and abroad, and provide opportunity for them to, to generate revenue for the things that they need on their installations. And we took that very seriously. And we were not nice guys to the leadership of APs. You know, I asked for very detailed reports, constantly asking for sidebar briefings inside my office to see the entire spreadsheet. I looked at every single number of every line of the budget and questioned it. And, and many times we went against the recommendation of the executive leadership with future investments to make sure that we were investing what we thought as senior leaders, the uniformed personnel, making the investment that was in the best interest of the soldier, sailor, airman, marine, and coast guard. Now, APHES, we know, is primarily focused on the Army and Air Force, um, but we service all service members across the globe. Um, many of our service members receive that service in, in some of the far reaches in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. But I can tell you countless times we made decisions that were not in the best interest of making money, but more so almost and many times the best interest of the service member. Um, now, we also had a responsibility to, to, to make sure that the, the, the organization thrived and lived. So we had to do things to make sure that we were making money. But when they did, that money goes right back in to the communities that our service members and families live in called our bases and, and posts. So. I'll tell you, it was a phenomenal responsibility. The other thing I have to credit APHES for, because I was a member of several boards, is they paid to professionally educate us. We became board certified by a professional organization. I had mandatory classes and constant training to keep me up on the right way to be a professional board member. And it was phenomenal. And it was world-class education and training um, to treat, to train us how to run a board, to make sure that we are doing um, the best of our ability to represent the service members. So, yeah, it's not just, uh, you know, a figurehead thing and something we do to, to meet the check the block. It's, it literally is um, your senior enlisted service members with their officer counterparts, making sure that we're doing everything in the best interest of our service members. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here. <laughs> from a former bird member. <laughs> we're not rogue. <laughs> not rogue. Not, not, not rogue. rogue. They're not, uh, man, not. They, they, uh, like I said, uh, we, we were hard on the leadership of the board. Um, and rightly I, I was, so. I was in a couple of meetings. I remember. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that's right. And rightly so. But the other thing is, is they always did what was in the best interest of our service members. And I, 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 I put my stamp of approval on it all day long. And, um, my theory is, and I can say this now, APHES is my first right of refusal. That's what I tell. I used to tell soldiers, give them the first right of refusal, go shop there first. And if you can find a better price, then go somewhere else. But you know what? Just remember, the profit that somebody else is making off is not going back into your base, right? So right. APHES is my first right of refusal. And I, I'm going to buy it there. The reason why I go somewhere else is if they don't have it. So we don't, they don't have everything, right? But when I'm on base, shop at. Hey, by the way, gas in Fort Myer, cheaper than all the surrounding areas here. I just wanted to let you know. It's a little oh. thing. I saved Excellent. myself about a, a nickel a gallon the other day. That's, that's good. <laughs> Go fill up. I love that. Did you go in and get a snack too? Like a healthy snack of after course. you were done? Yeah, good. Well, people with this Diet Coke and, you know, it's, I don't know if it's healthy, but it's, uh, that's it's, the, it's, my it, it's, it's, the, it's the lesser of healthy, unhealthy, I guess. Hmm. I, I'll take that as a Diet Coke drinker. I will, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> A lesser of unhealthy. That's exactly. Right. <laughs> so I, SMA Daily, I, I remember reading a, a little article, your top 10 leadership uh, tips for sergeant majors. Um, yes. You remember that? Good, great, great tips. You know, it talked about PT and all that, but yelling doesn't make you skinny PT. Doesn't not necessarily running That's PT, right. but just being out there, right? Being yeah. out there and letting the troops see that you're out there willing to put yeah. in work. And of course, it was uh, uh, um, you have to work very hard at being more mm -hmm. informed and less emotional. Uh, if you find yourself having to remind everyone all the time that you're the sergeant major and you're in charge, you're probably not, et cetera, probably et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to this uh, next question. Byron Lewis is asking it. He's asking, not only the SMA, he is a father and has a son at Penn State, or graduated, he says. Uh, 
what advice does he give to soldiers that have children that want to join during this time in our country? So I yeah, guess absolutely. what tips now that you're retired, what tips do you have for all those out there now? Yeah, I, you know, all of us as senior leaders during our tenures find a better way to communicate with the American public about the value of service um, to our nation. You know, I'm a true believer that not every American has to or should serve, um, but some do. We need them. We have to have them. And we have to have ones that believe in what um, we stand for. And um, it is a tough job by our recruiters across all services out there to go find that eligible population each year um, that of service members that want to do that. And I think what everybody should do, though, is consider service in the military. They should talk about it. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to bring the conversation of service back to the, the American dinner table because I was afraid we weren't having it. Right. And uh, and we've got to be careful that we don't do that because our service members are very much honored. But, you know, it's 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 not everywhere. And this is just truthful. It's not seen as a, a, a vocation of a of a future for for certain places. And it needs to be a discussion about service in our military. One of the things that I helped do right before I left was change the army uniform to the World War II Greens uniform. And it, its sole purpose was to re-identify ourselves with the American public, to be very honest with you. Um, you know, we went to a single dress uniform, blue uniform, and we weren't universally recognized like our Marine Corps. And I'm a big fan of the Marines. I'm a huge fan. I'm, I, I'm a huge fan of with a name like Dan Daly. You got to be right. So, uh, um, <laughs> But they, they kept solid on the uniform and then universally recognized. That's a Marine. And now we were very much recognized in our combat uniforms, but it was putting in the mindset of the American people that that's all we do. And I wanted to tell the story that there's another side of it. Yeah, we fight for our nation. That's our primary role. But there's a professional organization here that has over 150 MOSs that they're, they're, there's careers that, that men and women in America can start here and prosper, whether they stay in the military or they get out. And there's a million things to do. And I used to tell people all the time, we would do everything from infantry to astronaut. That's right. The United States Army has more astronauts than any other service right now. Proud of that. Matter of fact, well, I shouldn't say that because I don't know that to be factual. But the last year I was the SMA, we had more astronauts than anybody else. So <laughs> I'm proud of those astronauts down the Army astronauts down there. And uh, and to tell that story, we had to have a professional uniform that was identified. And what more um, period of, of service to this nation was more prevalent? than that of World War II, when millions and millions of men and women in this nation came together to fight for a common cause. And, uh, and then they came home victorious at the end of World War II, and people saw them in that beautiful Army service green uniform. And, uh, and still to this day, still to this day, there's pictures of those great service members, the greatest generation on mantles all across this nation. And it was a way that I thought we could reconnect our soldiers to the American public, and it's worked. It is. It's a universally recognized. That's a soldier. And I would just tell the Air Force, it's not too late to come back and put on that Army World War II uniform and be part of the Army again. You know, this what a, what an idea, right? What a concept. Army Air Corps. You think we could bring it? We, we, now, now we got our own little brother. We got the Space Force now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, it was worth a shot, Chief. I don't know. Maybe what kind of influence you have there at APs over the Air Force. Yeah. I, we might welcome them back. I, you know, we did order with all those green uniforms. We ordered a couple million gallons of green paint for those airplanes, just in case you changed your mind. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what the new, uh, the new chief master of the Air Force has to say, Joanne Bass. We'll see what she says about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. I'm now, now I'm getting a lot of, uh, I'll get a lot of Air Force hate mail, I'm sure. From, uh, but I love the Air Force. I love the Air Force. I love it. Yep. I love the Air Force. Hey, uh, oh, here's a question from uh, Mike Wags. Actually, a good question. Uh, uh, um, what advice can be given to soldiers on making themselves marketable in the civilian sector during the transition out of the army? Yeah, first I want to tell you is you already are. So don't think that you're not. You are very marketable. You have tangible and intangible um, things that civilian corporations pay big money for. And first and foremost, and I can tell you this is a personal experience and seeing it now, is that corporations out there want and desperately need leadership. That's something that we are very good at in the Army. Now, let's not even get into your technical MOS skills that are very much desirable, depending on what they are. Um, but first and foremost, don't be fall victim of your feeling like that you're not wanted. You are very much wanted. And don't be in a hurry. Take my advice. Now, I know not everybody's in the same financial situation when they separate from the military. But before you do have a plan and figure out what it is that you want to do. 
don't be, don't put yourself in a situation where you have to do something right away. All right. If you can, if you can prevent it, create a condition to get to where you want to do and the great job will find you. I promise you it will, because the skills you have are very much sought after across our nation right now for our service members. We had before the pandemic. So this is a little anomaly. And we worked hard on this as a senior listed advisors. We worked hard on this for three or four years with Congress, creating things like the credentialing assistance program, working with the Department of Veterans Affairs, Department of Labor. We put um, military liaisons, sergeants, majors in each one of those government branches. And they still work there today to build the connection between them. And we were proud of the fact that as all the services came together, we worked on this um, the first time in over 30 years, the unemployment of our service members was lower than that of the national average. Now, a little bit different because of COVID is going on, but this will bounce back. This is going to bounce back. And I'd say there's a lot of skills. What I would say is make sure you take advantage of the things the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard are doing for you. Use your degree benefits. Use the new credentialing assistant benefits. Gosh, I know it doesn't sound like it's a great thing, but HVAC technician, you can go get your certification. Some of those, some places in the country, they're starting off at $80,000 a year. I don't know if you know, that's good money. That's pretty <laughs> good money, right? Yeah. Um, so, there's, so you're going to serve in the military. You're going to sacrifice. And the American people have done a generous thing. They've given us benefits. And shame on you if you don't use them. Use them. That's why they're there. That's what they're intended for. And don't wait till you get out to say, well, nobody did anything for me. Well, you're going to serve. Service yourself from the great things that the American people and the American tax dollar have paid for. Use those benefits. Have a plan. I want every soldier to reenlist, sailor, airman, or marine. But I used to sit down and when they had the honest conversation, and if they want to get out, I would thank them for their service. But tell me you've got a plan, right? Tell me you've got a plan to transition. But those skills that you have, both the ones that you directly learned and the Army taught you through uh, your MOS training, but I'll tell you some of the skills that you acquired that either you can't learn in a traditional education platform or the military is one of the best breeding get browns for learning them, they're very sought after in the civilian sector. Set yourself up for success, use the benefits the military gave you, and create conditions that people want you and you don't have to search for a job because it's possible at every echelon. That sounded that sound perfect. Like we should just quote that piece. It's that <laughs> that like it great right career there. advice. That's yeah, excellent. great. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Excellent. excellent career advice. So as we get here to, to the end to wrap this up, where SMA Daily, where can we find out more about AUSA, uh, social media platforms? Also talk about the podcast. Let us know where every, let the audience know where we can find out more about all that. Absolutely. And Chief, again, I want to thank you and Julie for having me on today. And you did mention my top 10. Believe it or not, that is the cover story of Army Magazine coming out next month. So if you don't subscribe <laughs> and it's changed, because remember, I told you my leadership style changes. So for those of you that read it, this is new, not all different. If you're if you're uh, <laughs> so is, it, is it the two, yeah, the two point oh, make two point oh. still in, yeah, yelling, <laughs> yelling doesn't make a skinny PT is that's uh, still in there. But <laughs> um, that's coming out, but you can get all the information for the Association of United States Army at AUSA.org. That's AUSA.org. Uh, we got easy, friendly drop downs in there. One of the things I'd like to highlight is we do podcasts all the time. They're free. And we also do noon reports. You can register those on AUSA.org. Uh, we're upcoming again, SMA with squad leaders on 31 August and uh, myself hosting the SEAC. Um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, left, uh, Chiefs of Staff, senior enlisted advisor on the 14th of September. And we always have new stuff coming out all the time. The other thing we have is a periodical that's out twice a week, which is called Soldier Today. And it's, it's uh, focused on soldiers, but it's great for all service members. Fun facts, easily read on your phone, comes out. And you can subscribe to that for free by going to AOSA.org, going to publications, drop down the Soldier Today, click on it, send us your email and we'll send you a soldier today for free twice a week. And it's even got some funny stuff in there um, every once in a while to make you smile. So uh, um, <laughs> Chief, Julie, it's been phenomenal. Um, I would ask you is come take advantage of our podcast. Let's have you on the show. Let me interview you. And uh, we need to do that very soon. And we get the word out there to all of our members and soldiers about the great things that the exchange does for us.
We will get we will. you hooked up with someone from APHIS. Absolutely. And I do get your Soldier Today emails twice a week. They're very well done. I like them. People say the best thing on it is the photo that pops up first when it opens. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> They're not wrong, you know. <laughs> they want the perception of me being humble. It's shot now. It's out there, right? So, uh Anyway, um, it has been an honor. Give my best to executive leadership. It's been a while since I've been down there to the headquarters, but uh, I truly do thank you for all you do and my family throughout 30 years of service. Um, our huge fans of AFIS and all you do for our service members, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine, Coast Guardmen around the globe. Thank you. Stick around, stick around, SMA Daily. It's been truly an honor having you with us today. Thank you for spending time with us. You know, of course, this means so much to our airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coastians, family members. We wish you the best of luck in your new role at AUSA and look forward for what's to come. Exchange out. Exchange out.